through our afternoons together, you'll see a, a light group of people that are here. Light in numbers is what I mean. Uh, but by the end of the week, there are just there are hundreds of viewers that are popping through and looking at what's being presented, because what we have is very serious in its nature. So please be talking to your relatives and your friends and your neighbors next door. And if there's questions that they have for us, represent them. Don't be shy. Uh, so with that, welcome to Native Strong. Again, thank you for being here. And I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Lyle Ignace. Uh, he is our main host, and he has a lot of information to share, certainly from last week. Dr. Ignace. Thank you, uh, Mark. Thank you, Jeremiah, for the introduction. A um, lot of information. I've added a few uh, more key points to um, what's going on here in Indian country. And so, as always, I usually speak from kind of a worldwide perspective and bring it back to uh, Wisconsin. So as of yesterday, uh, worldwide, uh, 8.2 million cases uh, of coronavirus. This is a 14% increase from the week prior. Uh, the number of recovered is a little over 4 million. This is actually, a, it has been a huge increase in, in this in the terms of, of who has recovered. Uh, the number of deaths, 445,000 uh, in the 16.5% increase. This is a pretty significant jump as well. Uh, from previous, from last week, I, I uh, let everybody know that at that point it was a 7.5%, so 7.5 up to uh, now 16%. That's a pretty significant jump. Uh, here in the United States, uh, almost 2.2 million. That's a 7.9% increase from the week prior. This is pretty stable. Uh, it hasn't uh, changed much. It was 7.6 last week. We uh, actually have tested uh, a fair amount. We've tested 4 million people uh, from the week prior. Uh, last time I reported, we tested 3 million people uh, over that past week. So we've dramatically increased our testing capabilities uh, throughout the U.S. The number of recovered, 604,000. This is a 13.1% increase. The number of deaths, 119%, uh, 4.3% uh, increase. This is actually going down, and the trend has been going down over the last month. So uh, that is good news. Here in Wisconsin, uh, 23,454 cases. That's 8.6% increase. Uh, the number of recovered, 17,613, which is a 17.4% uh, increase. And uh, both of these numbers uh, in terms of cases is going down. Uh, the number of recovered has, um, has tapered off a little bit, but has maintained itself at 17%. Uh, and the fatalities here in Wisconsin at 712, that's a 6.1% increase from the week prior. And over the last three weeks, uh, the number of deaths here in, in Wisconsin has been trending downwards. Just to, as a, as a reminder, uh, there are 573 federally recognized American Indian and Alaska Native tribes in the country. Uh, and their descendants are, are eligible for uh, services at any federal, uh, tribal, or urban health center. Uh, IH IHS provides comprehensive and culturally competent care for uh, 2.6 million individuals. Um, this is uh, almost a little, uh, about 50% of the population uh, of all natives at 5.2 million. And what we know is that 70, even though uh, we have reservation lands in, in, throughout the country, 70% 70, 70 of our native population resides off of their, of their native uh, lands and, and uh, in urban settings. So it's important to, to know and realize that uh, a good portion of our population uh, do not reside on their respective reservations, but uh, uh, do live in, <clears throat> in, in some major uh, metropolitan areas. So 
let's go to the next slide. Yes. So some changes have occurred uh, over the past week. So this is the latest IHS dashboard related to cases, positive cases, negative cases. And <clears throat> I would say the majority of, uh, of, of testing centers and facilities, tribal health centers are reporting uh, their cases. So this is a pretty good you know, snapshot of, of what's going on in all of our respective areas. And as you go through, you could see um, the the major areas um, that have that have been tested positive are Albuquerque, 892 cases, uh, Nashville, 971, Great Plains, 746, Navajo, 7,592, Phoenix area, uh, 3,277, um, and Oklahoma City and Portland. So. These are areas that have shown um, a good portion of, of cases in, in Indian country. And the table that is adjacent uh, to this, I, I put in two tables, uh, two columns. One is the number of cases that have changed from the week prior that says June 16th. So that is uh, yesterday compared what's been going on over the last seven days. Uh, you can see as you go down that column, the areas that have the greatest, uh, greatest activity uh, in cases. So uh, we look at the Great Plains, you see a highlighted box there, 175. Navajo um, has had 606 new cases over the past week. Oklahoma City, 338. Phoenix, 742 and Portland 150. Now, the presentation I gave a week ago, uh, June 11th, uh, you can see the, the number of cases from the week prior to that date. And you can see kind of an overlap of, of, of the areas. We see the Great Plains had an increase of 134 cases from the week prior, uh, Navajo 623, Phoenix 615, Portland 102. And it's the big difference in this, this week compared to last week, is that um, last week's uh, report out, I, there was 1,755 cases. From that date on, there's been 2,322 cases. Now, you know, when you look at these numbers, they may not mean a whole lot, but when you look comparatively uh, week after week, you can see, you can start tracking trends. And I will say that this number, 2,322, is the largest number increase uh, in a week uh, since I've been reporting this out. So um, that is uh, a concerning, uh, that is concerning uh, in, in particular when we look at when we look at all of the cases and where they are occurring, uh, I think you can get a good sense of, of where uh, the dynamics are, are changing. So when we look further on in that uh, percent change uh, column, uh, you get a better sense of, of what's going on as well. So in Alaska, the percent change is 33%. In the Great Plains, 30%. Oklahoma City, 80%. Portland, 30 Tucson, 81%. Uh, the percent change average has been about 17. So anything above the average, uh, I would definitely be concerned given the percent increase um, over that time. So, um, you know, Great Plains, obviously Navajo, uh, dealing with the large numbers there. Oklahoma City's changing. Phoenix is dramatically changing. And, and Portland, um, uh, obviously, and then Tucson has this huge increase of... Uh, in the number of cases. When we look at the next column, percent positive, this is the number of, of, of positive cases to the overall number of tests. Um, when you look at the, at the bottom, it says 5.37. That's the average uh, percent positive of cases. You start getting some overlap as to what's going on. So we, we know Navajo has a, a very high rate uh, and they're sitting at uh, 10.6. Uh, Nashville 8.5, um, California 
Portland and Tucson. So obviously the amount of testing that's occurring in these areas, they're, they're getting a higher percentage uh, of their testing is coming, coming back positive. So um, in the last column, we see uh, the trend and I've been following and tracking these uh, over the last, uh, you know, seven weeks. And I look at trends from week to week and how things are progressing over time. And so, uh, as you can see, an, an F is actually a flattening, uh, a flattening of, of the activity that's going on. So areas that um, perhaps show the, the least dramatic change, either up or down, um, would be Alaska you know, Albuquerque, uh, Bemidji, uh, Billings in California. The other areas that I would consider as a flattening activity would be Nashville and Navajo. Now I know they have a lot of numbers in Navajo, but I think uh, looking at at least their progression over time here is that they may be flattening now. They may be peak, peaking uh, and let's hope this is the peak of, of their activity and hopefully start seeing uh, Navajo go down on, on the other side. So um, the areas that I'm that I'm see as the most concerning are the Great Plains. And the Great Plains would be like North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, um, uh, Kansas, uh, and Nebraska. Um, so there, Oklahoma City, obviously we've heard in the news, Oklahoma's had a spike in cases. Well, I think you can see where some of that is occurring, uh, certainly in, in, in Indian country, that part of that contribution is, is due to uh, natives. And so there's a trend in Oklahoma, the Oklahoma City area. We're looking at a trend, obviously in Phoenix, we hear about Arizona, the state of Arizona, uh, you know, due to, do realize that um, uh, Phoenix uh, does include um, uh, Utah and Nevada, uh, as well as the state of Arizona. So Phoenix isn't just Arizona, but collectively in those three states. So there's been a, a continued progression of cases in that area, as well as Portland and in Tucson. So, um, you know, Week to week, you know, it's hard to see uh, the forest through the trees when you look at numbers on a day-to-day -day basis. But when you start looking and compiling information on a weekly basis, you can definitely see uh, the activity and the trends that are uh, that are ongoing. So, um, um, so those are my the areas that I am, I would be uh, highlighting and um, concerned about its trend. Next slide. So looking back at the Bemidji area, <clears throat> and we'll just go around the horn in terms of what's going on in terms of, uh, of cases and activity. So we see uh, here in Wisconsin, uh, the number of cases, uh, 23,454, that's an 8.6% increase from the week prior. Uh, this is actually uh, trending downwards, and it has been trending downwards uh, for the last four weeks. So this is good news. Um, uh, reporting out from the number of cases from one week prior, there's 1,861. This is actually a little over 300 less or fewer cases uh, than was reported out the week prior. In Mich Michigan, believe it or not, um, you know, in the beginning, they were dealing with very high numbers more than any other state in our area. Um, they have definitely peaked and they are on the downslide. So as of right now, they've had a 1.9% increase in the number of cases. Uh, from a week prior, they've reported out 1,115. So this is a pretty dramatic change uh, for the state of Michigan. Uh, and this is, um, they've had uh, 2,500 less cases reported this week than the week prior. So uh, hopefully this is something that sticks uh, for the st uh, state of uh, Michigan and continues to trend even further and down. Uh, in Indiana, 38,337, 6.9% um, increase. This is uh, um, uh, about the same as it was the week prior. 
and roughly, if you believe it or not, almost like three cases uh, more than last week. So uh, nothing has really, at least dramatically changed in, in the state of Indiana, and they've been maintaining themselves uh, pretty flat. So in Illinois, uh, 134,118, uh, that's a 3.3% increase from the week prior. Um, they're reporting 4,328 new cases from the week prior. This is actually 2,600 fewer cases than the week prior. So for the state of Illinois, this is uh, a really dramatic change for the state um, and uh, has been trending downwards for the last uh, four weeks. So uh, this is certainly uh, ideal uh, for the state of uh, Illinois. In Minnesota, um, they have 31,296 cases, 8.4% um, uh, increase from, from the week prior. They've had 2,427 new cases. Um, so that is, that is good news. And uh, they have been trending downwards as well. So everyone has been trending downwards um, for the last uh, uh, three weeks which is all good news. Uh, Indiana has, has flattened out right now. Next slide. If we get uh, a little closer look in terms of uh, native country in, in Michigan, we may need to click a few to highlight the tribes. Yes. So, when we look at the tribes of, of Michigan, the 12 tribes and the counties, respective uh, counties that they reside in, uh, as I reported out, they've had a fairly significant drop in the number of new cases uh, in Michigan, which is great. And as you go down in terms of the cases uh, by county, uh, you can see that there really has not been any changes in the number of cases. So a good portion of the tribes um, that reside in these respective counties have not seen uh, any new changes really. And that is dramatically, uh, that is very significant. Um, with the exception of, of maybe Allegan for Gun, Gun Lake Potawatomi, uh, Saginaw and Pokagon, these are obviously, they reside in counties that are, that have a, a very a larger mixed population uh, in their area. So it's hard to uh, infer uh, if these changes are, are, are native related or not. So, um, you know, it's, it's hard to say, but when we start looking at the reported out cases and, and now Michigan, this is the second week they've actually been able to report out on the number of native uh, native cases in, in the state. So um, if you look at the bottom here, it says uh, total native population, um, 241. So this is, they were reporting out 241 cases. This is nine cases more than the week prior, 3.9%. So uh, given, given kind of the overall picture of, of natives to everyone else in the state, um, when they report out over 1,100 new cases, only nine of those uh, are designated as being native, so that is a good that is a good sign um, that maybe things are slowing in in the state of Michigan. Next slide. So we get to Minnesota, um, and we see the eleven tribes uh, uh, that are in their respective counties in in Minnesota. Um, slightly different uh, story to tell here. Um, the counties um, have have shown, you know, incremental increases in the number of cases, and the majority of, of counties have uh, shown increases. So, but they're modest. And so, whether or not these are directly related to uh, the native population, uh, unable to say. But <clears throat> I would say, for the most part. Um, the tribes, the tribes that do reside in these counties, um, have at least the trend is is flat uh, or downwards. 
So there, Minnesota's uh, Department of Public Health is reporting 269 um, cases. This is 38 new cases compared to the week prior and a 16.5% increase, which is uh, for, for Minnesota and the number of, of natives that are being reported out, uh, this is the single most uh, increase um, of, of natives in the state of Minnesota. So um, a little concerning, hard to say if it's a trend. I hope it's just a one-off one and that this uh, uh, goes the other direction. So <clears throat> uh, next slide. Back here in Wisconsin, uh, the, we have our 11 tribes here with their respective counties. Um, just about, I would say for the most part, Wisconsin has remained fairly quiet uh, in, in terms of the respective tribes and, and, and the counties that they reside in. Um, Oneida, of course, uh, has an overlap of, of two counties, uh, Otagami and Brown. Uh, they are the um, have a significant number of cases uh, due to clustering outbreaks. Um, some of it, uh, most of it, is off the reservation. So um, they've had 42 new cases uh, over the, the counties have had 42 new cases over the last week, and um, you know Anita continues to uh, face. Um, uh, new and, and more um, individuals uh, with coronavirus. And so last number I heard it was 49, uh, 49 cases starting this week. So um, hopefully this is something that will peak and, and start uh, on the downslide and, and becoming fewer and fewer uh, with each given day. <clears throat> So as you go through uh, all the tribes and, and their respective counties, uh, again, incremental increase is not dramatic, uh, but there are uh, new uh, reported cases here in Wisconsin, uh, 236 cases as of yesterday. <coughs> this is 13 uh, new cases from the week prior, 5.8% uh, increase. So um, again, the, the just incremental increases on a regular basis. Um, and they add up, you know, they add up over time. And um, it's just, there's no dramatic slowing in the number of, of cases that are being reported. It's just a constant um, addition of new cases every week. So uh, by no means are we out of this uh, epi uh, pandemic right now. Next slide. So I, I do like to include Illinois. Um, they are part of the Bemidji area. There is an urban center in Chicago. Um, this is not, uh, the urban center there is not reporting out testing on all of the cases that are identified. And, but they ha have 204 cases. So that's two new cases from the week prior. And you can see how dramatic the numbers uh, are for the state of Illinois, over 134,000. Um, the four main largest counties, McHenry, Lake, Cook, and Chicago, uh, have the greatest number of cases. Um, that's in the uh, northeast corner, just south of uh, Wisconsin. And uh, the borders, uh, two, two uh, major counties, Kenosha and Racine, uh, which also has a pretty dramatic uh, rise in, in cases as of lately. So. But when we look at the, their public health data, uh, we can see that um, they do a little better job in displaying demographics. Uh, and so when you look at this graph, you can see that that top number will go from left to right. Uh, that top number uh, that says nine, uh, that's the number of native cases uh, um, that have been diagnosed uh, uh, less than 20 years of age. Next column is 26. Uh, next age group, 29, 32, 47, 30, uh, 19, and 12. So between this week and last week, there really has not been any dramatic change. They've only had two new cases, which is good. Um, but at least we get a little more insight into not just how many natives have, have coronavirus, but um, um, you know what, what's the age distribution that uh, we're seeing and 
obviously that helps uh, target uh, our efforts to, to minimize. So uh, next slide. When we look, uh, bring it back here to Wisconsin, um, <clears throat> this is uh, the, from our Wisconsin Public Health uh, website. Uh, American Indians, the number of cases is 236. As I mentioned, that's 13 new cases from the week prior, 5.8% increase. And um, the number of fatalities related to coronavirus has been zero. Uh, it has been zero for the last three weeks, so that is, uh, that is good news. But um, again, this incremental increase, uh, you know, the week prior, uh, it was uh, 223, the week before that, 212, the week before that, 186, 151, 90. So it, again, not huge dramatic leaps uh, in, in, in terms of cases. It's this, this uh, kind of creeping incremental uh, additions uh, every week. So uh, what may have seemed like a lot a couple weeks ago, is nothing compared to what we're seeing now. And so this is an ongoing effort um, to, to um, as a, in a, a pretty good reminder that this is, uh, this is here with us and um, we're gonna have to um, collectively find ways to prevent um, this ongoing infection within our communities. <clears throat> Next slide. So, I wanted to introduce uh, kind of a new slide. Uh, this is the this is in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, this is the seven day average. So um, it's important to see how things are trending. Each day is a seven day average from that day past. So as the days have go by, you can see what the trend is <clears throat> for the last uh, for the last week, and you can as you go. <clears throat> kind of up this uh, graph, you can see the peak of this uh, was at its highest with a seven day average of 473 cases. And that was on March, I'm sorry, that was on May 30th. So May 30th, 479 cases. That was the kind of record day for us in terms of the number of cases in the state of Wisconsin. There was actually 733 cases that day, um, and since then, uh, the trend has has uh, slowly uh, um, gone down. And so, with today, the uh, seven-day average uh, as of June 16th um, is 265. So, um, this certainly would indicate we are on the downslide. Um, to, uh, to the virus here in Wisconsin. Uh, I'd like to say that was the case uh, for all states. Um, I think when we look at the, in the Bemidji area where we currently reside, um, so that's Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Illinois, <clears throat> hopefully all these will continue to decrease. Um, although uh, as of an hour ago, uh, I just got the latest numbers for the state of Wisconsin, and we just had another spike. Um, and the spike was 422 cases in the last 24 hours. So uh, this is going to change. Uh, this is going to change the dynamics of our seven-day average. Um, hopefully this is a one-off day and not uh, things to, not uh, kind of the uh, trend that will be moving forward. So. Um, hopefully that's just a one day a one day number that that uh, hopefully goes down quickly. So <clears throat> next slide. Bringing it back to uh, Milwaukee and we have 9,918 cases, uh, 324 fatalities associated. We have the middle graph here of, of Milwaukee County uh, showing um, multiple, uh, circles, yellow circles, and this is usually uh, the indication as to where these cases uh, reside in those census tracts. So the smaller the circle, the smaller the number, the bigger the circle, uh, obviously the more cases. So when we first started seeing the development of cases in Milwaukee, uh, the majority of the cases were on the north side uh, north of the highway I-94, uh, 
Um, that was probably the trend that was going on for the first six weeks. However, over the six weeks prior, after that, we started seeing trends going down into the south side and we had much bigger uh, circles. And so uh, things seem to uh, be uh, lightened a, a, a lot on the north side. And now we're starting to see a lightening on the uh, south side. So uh, these, uh, you know, uh, circles uh, you know, on the south side, when you highlight and click on those, uh, they are in the low teens, so like 10, 11, 12, 14. Um, not, certainly not the way it was even three weeks ago when we were dealing with 40s, 50s uh, in these areas. So uh, they're becoming fewer and fewer. Uh, I wanted to draw your attention to the two middle sl slides on the left and right. <clears throat> So on the left, you see the number of cases by age group. So you have the less than 10, 20, 30, 40 age groups, 50, 60, all the way up. Um, you can see the, the, this kind of bell shape is kind of skewed, what we call skewed or looking more uh, to the left. And, and we're, it's skewed to the left, meaning obviously there's more, more concentration of numbers uh, in these younger age groups. Um, given the current environment and, and activities that are going on, not just in Milwaukee, but throughout the entire country, uh, there's a good possibility that we may be seeing more and more of this skewing going, uh, really spiking to uh, the younger population. So um, with the, the increase in cases um, that we just saw today, uh, it's quite possible we may be seeing the beginning of, of that going on. On the right-hand side, I'm sorry, go back one. If we go to the right-hand side and the total number of deaths, so we do know that the high-risk individuals, older you are, the higher the risk, and certainly the, uh, the outcome um, is, is uh, uh, more dangerous uh, for older age groups. And so even though we may be seeing a lot more younger cases, uh, that is not um, directly showing um, the you know, poor outcomes and, and fatalities in our younger population. So um, good, uh, good that we're not seeing um, the high cases in the young people resulting in, in high mortality either. So uh, next slide. So here in uh, the Milwaukee County, uh, we have uh, uh, race and ethnicity breakdowns. And so uh, on the far left, we have the Hispanic and Latino uh, numbers, then the, uh, our African-American community, uh, white. And then as we go further to the right, uh, the second column to the right, that is the American Indian Alaskan Native column of, of 35 uh, here in Wisconsin, or the, I'm sorry, here in Milwaukee County, that's still 0.4% uh, uh, of the number of cases. So still small, but again, every week we're adding new cases, new cases, new cases. And so um, from the week prior, uh, it's been six new cases uh, that have been um, added to this column. So uh, it seems to be a never ending story, but uh, is a reality that we're gonna need to face uh, every day. So next slide. <clears throat> so as a reminder, um, um, we know we know who the individuals are that are at risk uh, of not only uh, severe illness but also um, um, poor outcomes as a result. Uh, ages uh, older population, 65 and older individuals uh, that are much higher risk um, who reside in a nursing home or long-term care facilities. Individuals that have underlying chronic uh, care conditions such as uh, cardiovascular disease, um, high blood pressure, uh, lung disease, COPD, uh, certainly people with COPD that are on that wear oxygen. Uh, we're also uh, talking about moderate to severe uncontrolled asthmatics, uh, immunocompromised individuals uh, who uh, have underlying cancer or undergoing treatment for cancer, uh, transplant patients, uncontrolled uh, diabetes, kidney problems, liver problems, um, autoimmune diseases, um, people who may be on uh, corticosteroids. Um, so a lot of, uh, you know, 
um, a lot of uh, diseases uh, that that may render your immune system uh, uh, weak um, are certainly at risk. So the the dynamic of this hasn't changed, uh, but <clears throat> but is a good reminder uh, who we need to pay particular attention to, uh, and and who we need to help protect uh, the most. So next slide. So. Here at, at Glick, we are trying to be proactive as much as possible in, in the prevention and the mitigation. Uh, we offer up um, uh, personal hygiene kits and cleaning kits. Um, we've just been able to commandeer um, uh, a fair amount of hand sanitizer. Uh, so with these cleaning kits of, of bleach and um, um, laundry detergents, um, um, bars of soap and hand soap. We're also going to be including in these packets uh, hand sanitizer as well as face masks. So these cleaning kits are going to be, you're going to need them. Uh, you're going to need them for ongoing, even this week, next week, next month, probably in the, for the foreseeable future. But these will have the essential items that you will need to help protect yourself and your family at home. Uh, so we're going to be offering that up starting next week. Um, and if uh, you feel uh, a need to, to, to get or need uh, items such as these, uh, please don't hesitate to call us at 414-316-5051 and ask for Alicia Terry. She'll help uh, in organizing uh, a date and time for that pickup for you. So um, please do that. Our uh, youth empowerment uh, program, they are actively engaged. School is out, which means kids, given this time, kids don't know where to go, what to do, and, and you know, uh, they're going to get bored. So in this time, we're becoming more and more virtual. And so our youth empowerment programs, uh, looking at uh, daily youth challenges uh, by social media, so please uh, stay tuned and engage in these activities. I do know they offer up um, some, some, some daily prizes. So um, if you participate, you certainly have an opportunity to, to get one of those uh, great prizes. So um, they're looking at a virtual youth uh, summer camp and this is gonna start in July. Um, so pay, uh, please pay attention to the dates uh, when that will start. Um, they have Seasons of Change uh, Teenage Girls Meeting every Wednesday. Uh, this will be ongoing in, Jul in July. Um, they're looking at uh, perhaps a face-to-face -face interaction to uh, virtual and maybe uh, considering alternating. It really depends on the dynamic, uh, but they want uh, our, young, uh, our young women to, to get uh, involved and interact and be social. Uh, teen groups. Um, they're looking at uh, three uh, personal gatherings uh, over the next couple months in July and August. So uh, please pay attention to the dates, times. Uh, follow us on Facebook on, or our social media or our website. Or our, yeah, our website. And um, if you have any questions, Stacy Hollister is our director, and uh, she can be reached at uh, that number 316-5050. So um, a lot of activities that are there to help support our, our native youth. Next slide. Also in partnership with the Hunger Task Force, um, we have been able to, uh, we've been offered uh, 30 pound boxes of fresh produce uh, for pickup. This is occurring on Wednesdays. Uh, please call us to pick up a, a box on these days. It is free. We want to help support healthy living during this time. Uh, a lot of fresh produce uh, for for um, families. So um, uh, better than going to a fast food joint, and it's healthier. And on top of that, it's free. So can't beat those uh, those two things. So 30 pound uh, boxes of fresh produce. Um, uh, please uh, stop by and uh, re reserve a box for yourself for pickup. So. Uh, that could be 316-5011, so please call. 
We're also offering uh, virtual discussions on pre-diabetes uh, and not only education and awareness, uh, but also looking at uh, high blood pressure and cholesterol. Uh, so a lot of preventative education activities um, in this day and age, we're, we're doing a lot more virtual, uh, uh, virtual uh, approaches to education and prevention. So as you see, the <clears throat> pre-diabetes is on Mondays, 11 to noon, and then high blood pressure cholesterol on Thursdays, uh, five to six. So uh, please um, attend those uh, if you are concerned or have a family member that uh, is not only at risk or who may be suffering from, from one of these ailments. Our Circles of uh, Strength program, um, were, um, specifically um, dealing with domestic violence and sexual assault, uh, we have an active program. Uh, we have providers uh, that are at standby right now to help assist uh, in, in guidance and, and even safety planning, emotional support, even uh, medical and behavioral health treatments. So uh, please feel free to take advantage of, of these services that we offer. Um, next slide. Over the Next couple of months, um, the Circles of Care program is expanding its services. Um, where they've created uh, new services, uh, uh, yoga in the garden. Uh, we have a garden, um, not on our location, but it's close by. Workouts in the garden and women's domestic violence sexual assault support group. Uh, we are offering this through our Zoom, Zoom virtual support uh, uh, telehealth. So um, just trying to be creative, trying to reach out to everyone, uh, finding new ways to communicate and, and being able to socialize uh, given, um, given the pandemic. We want to make sure that we can reach out to everyone. Uh, we're also uh, looking at our, our women's beating uh, kits we have available. Uh, so that is something new as well. So we're trying to be as proactive as, as possible uh, when you're sitting at home and uh, just uh, um, finish supper and you want something to do, maybe uh, take up beating. Um, um, just make sure you don't poke yourself. Next slide. And a reminder, as usual, uh, washing your hands and a good public uh, health service announcement. Always good to keep uh, clean, whether it's bacteria, viruses, or even the coronavirus. Washing your hands will be the cornerstone of maintaining a healthy, uh, a healthy uh, contact, not only with yourself, but even uh, within your home and in the social uh, public uh, setting. So uh, if you don't have soap, uh, if we, you've had hand sanitizer, then we're going to be providing that to our community, so um, there won't be any excuses. Uh, so washing your hands or hand sanitizer that we'll be able to offer you, um, it'll be important. Next slide. And obviously, uh, testing. Um, we are fully capable um, and readily accessible to testing. Uh, the only thing we ask is that you call ahead to set up a date and a time uh, um, after you are, have been assessed and evaluated. Uh, we will get you uh, set up with the appropriate test um, for either you, uh, your loved one, or your family or relatives. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, just call us and we'll, we'll help uh, coordinate that effort. Obviously, the most important aspects are and signs uh, is um, and I'm sure we all know this, but it's fevers, uh, cough, uh, short of breath, sore throat, headaches, extreme fatigue, body aches, muscle aches, joint aches, nausea, vomiting, even diarrhea. And uh, we've had cases of, of people just presenting with the loss of smell or taste. So as, as, as minor as that may seem, um, they did come back positive for the coronavirus. So uh, no, no symptom is, is to be ignored. Uh, everything will need to be taken into consideration. So 
Uh, it's important that you pay attention to self, to yourself, because <clears throat> you may not have all of these symptoms. And that's what we're finding out is people don't always have to have all the symptoms. People don't always have to have a fever. Some people don't even have a cough. Maybe they just have a headache and maybe they have lost a smell, lost a taste, or maybe their joints hurt. That's unexplainable to them, which is new. And maybe they have nausea, vomiting. Maybe they have some loose stools, diarrhea. It can be any combination of any of these. It does not have to be 100% across the board for all of them. So if you feel like you have a sign or symptom of coronavirus, uh, please feel free to call us uh, 303-9526 and we will, we will set you up. And our testing crew, our frontline staff, we're happy to assist. Uh, we take your calls. We assess you, we do the intakes, we set you up, we test you, we, we pat you on the back and, and um, we'll, we'll be there to help support you. Um, not only in testing, but also in contact tracing and um, you will get a call back from one of us to ask how you're doing if you have the virus. Uh, just because you get tested, it's not, it's not uh, you're not done. You're not done with us, we will continue to uh, inter intervene in your life to assure that uh, if you do have the virus that you are not alone and we will help support you um, through through not only education but uh, what to do at home and and how to do it and what you uh, can do to help prevent your family so please don't uh, hesitate to call us and with that I will turn it back over to our dynamic uh, duo of moderators and uh, take any questions. Dr. Ignace, we got a, a question that came in uh, in writing and it is exactly right on. Uh, as you know, summer months are upon us. Uh, I know that there's some, been some leadership phone calls and a lot of uh, discussion around our ceremonies and a lot of discussion about when we go home to visit relatives, you know, the homes meaning reservations. If we head west, maybe a couple hours north, two hours, six, seven hour drives. And, and the question is, hey, we did everything we could in our house. We cleaned our clothes. We're, we're, set, we're, we're, we're as clean as we possibly can. You know, we're ready to go. And, and what do we need to know when we're, when we're gonna hit the road? So as a dad, I know that we've taken those trips back home over and over again since, since we were children, or maybe they just arrived in Milwaukee and they're going back and forth. Uh, we know where the gas stations are that have hand dis, uh, dis, dispensers after you're done with the gas pump. They're, they're attached now to pillars where you can clean your hands after touching the pump. We know that we should be packing our own food instead of kind of multiplying our exposure to uh, possibility of transmission. We also know as families that when we're when we're kind of around people, you've constantly shared, assume that someone has it. Uh, so I'm wondering if you have some additional kind of tips or insights for people that are going to take those journeys uh, <laughs> to see their relatives this summer, and they're thinking, hey, we did everything we could, and now we're going to hit the road. And the moment that car starts <laughs> down the road. Uh, what should mom and dad be looking for? Yeah, so, you know, this is, you know, several months, schools are out, and people want to, you know, traditionally have taken their uh, summer vacations or their su summer journeys and expected uh, activities, normal activities. So just as a reminder, um, uh, news, news that is national news that is going out to, you know, almost – uh, I think it's like 20, 20 states now have, have shown some increasing in the number of cases being reported, daily reporting uh, this past week. So uh, states like Montana, Wyoming, uh, Colorado, Utah, uh, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, California, uh, Washington, you know, all along the West Coast, uh, all the way down to the Southern states, Texas, um, you know, it, it, the virus is not going away, uh, which is a very, the news that is coming out with the cases, the increase in cases that are going on in this past week is a pretty good reminder that this is not over. 
uh, it is not over by any means. And that means we can't let our guard down. Uh, we can't get complacent. We can't, um, we, we can't give in to uh, being impatient uh, to, to wanting to do things. I think I would certainly encourage to be active outside, outdoors, uh, to, to visit uh, when, when appropriate, uh, interact when appropriate and and but it, it, it is a good reminder that all of the contact that you will be um, involved with whether it's let's say going from here to Minnesota or North or South Dakota and you know you're going to be driving you know you're going to be going to gas stations you go to bathrooms you go to the pumps you go to restaurants you go to hotels and food and packs so <clears throat> again, whatever you're doing at home, you need to maintain on the road. And Father's Day is coming up. There's going to be a lot of get-togethers, a lot of social events. Again, we're talking about uh, our elders. We're talking about uh, prevention, mitigation. Uh, just because it's family, uh, it's, uh, you still need to be aware of, 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 uh, of that social distance. I mean, even though you know, and more than likely they don't have, or nobody there will have it. But we hear these cases about super spreaders. We hear cases about asymptomatic people, and the next thing you know, the whole family has it. So uh, concerning, not all, it's not gonna happen to all uh, families. Uh, it just leaves you a little, have to be apprehensive, cautious, um, uh, but maintain that preventative approach. I want to follow up on that one, especially <clears throat> when we put together the information that you carefully show for the first 45 minutes of our program. And that is uh, May 30th, when there was a spike in the state of Wisconsin. And COVID-19 has that kind of incubation period of, uh, I believe, from what I've read in literature, uh, five and a half days at the soonest, 14 days, kind of when it's being evidenced. And when we look at the news cycle, of what happened about 15, 14 days before that spike of COVID-19. On May 14th at 6 p.m., the, uh, the Wisconsin Supreme Court announced uh, the striking down of the safer at home here in Wisconsin. And, and there it was, uh, just within that incubation period, mm -hmm. the significant spike. Uh, I think that is very important that parents if we're looking out after vulnerable people that, that we recognize and look back at where those spikes are and why they're happening mm -hmm. and understand that it not be just happening on the day where the spike is occurring, but what has happened before. And where I'm headed with this is uh, this past weekend, you were at a, uh, a vigil mm -hmm. that our native community was having sponsored by a lot of different organizations. Um, at the Oloma campus, uh, Potawatomi land, right here in the middle of Wisconsin on Milwaukee's north side. And what you saw were a lot of interactions between a lot of people. And I was wondering if you might uh, have some insights. You, you attended a couple days for, for a period of time. And if there are some vulnerabilities or, or things that as Native people that you witnessed as Native people are gathering on our terms. Uh, and I will say this, the vigil that was held has, there is now a new presence in Milwaukee instead of marches, that there are now social justice vigils being held and that, that those vigils are just arising this week. Uh, we also know that a lot of the Black Lives Matter advocates and organizers attended our native vigil. And we're happy to see those vigils start to rise in number but it's a new factor in how people gather mm -hmm. and what they're doing rather than just kind of marching through the street in great numbers. Now they're gonna be gathering together. So I'm hoping if you have a couple insights on that kind of thing, should someone want to attend uh, a vigil either tonight or as they're growing going forward. Sure, so um, Mark, as you mentioned, there's kind of two points I wanted to make. So May 30th, uh, that was about a week after, um, a week after Memorial Day. And so there was a fair amount of travel interaction that was going on at that time. So uh, it, it wasn't, um, it wasn't um, surprising to see that there would be a spike. Uh, I, I think 
maybe it was a little surprising to actually how many cases uh, came of came of that opening. Um, and but since then, the 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 numbers have slowly gone down. So I think there's just a, a much more heightened awareness of of protection um, actively going on now. And so even though we may be opening up and more interaction and more engagement, I think there's a, there's a, there's a stronger sense of, of needing and willingness to now uh, kind of conform to, to prevent preventing uh, transmission. So if that means a face covering or some kind of mask or um, or um, I, I think the, the general sense is most people when they're out in public or in social situations that they are going to be wearing uh, that type of pr uh, protectiveness. And, and, and that kind of goes into, um, uh, you know, certainly the, the unity fire that we, uh, uh, that, that I attended uh, with you there, um, you know, in support of that, uh, I wanted to at least, not only be part, participate, but also be kind of an observer uh, of activity and how the, this interaction was to occur. It was it was in a an open field uh, outside um, the whole time. Um, if there was any interaction, there was plenty of distance uh, amongst everyone. Everyone wore a mask uh, during this time. There was hand sanitizer available. Um, there, there wasn't much, you know, physical interaction of, of handshaking or, um, you know, uh, even, you know, quick hugs and, and 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 such, which isn't our normal interaction, you know, our, our normal social behavior. But I think there's just a good understanding that people need to keep their respective distances to one another. I think we all respect each other's spaces and, and certainly in, in that preventive uh, protection with the mask. Um, and my sense of, of, of risk uh, actually was pretty low. Um, <clears throat> and I believe me, if I felt there was a, a high risk, I, I would have you know, made a comment to, to maybe correct some behavior, but um, Everyone there, I think, understood what needed to be done, and they followed it. And um, it was, it was also good fortune that to actually have a supply of masks available to people, so they can just pick it up, and uh, not only for adults but also for kids. So, again, it is the game right now is protection and prevention, and it's something that that shouldn't that I and and even the gathering that were there. Uh, you know, I think when I was uh, at the time I was there, there was no more than 25 people, but there was definitely enough spacing uh, amongst us that, you know, we weren't uh, shoulder to shoulder, but we were, you know, more than arm's length in both directions from one another. So uh, I thought the interaction was perfect uh, and um, the event was great. And um, I think everyone was respectful of, of each other's space. I just want to follow up with the, the comments and say thanks for, for being there for one and also that folks take note of, of if we are going to enter into these ceremonies that there's, there's older ways that still stand uh, and in particular are helping us today. And by that I mean when we had the fire, uh, that unity fire, it was over 24 hours. So we had plenty of foot traffic. But we wanted, we didn't want any large group or have a large entertainment venue, nor did we advertise any of the, the ceremonies that were happening in the time of them. Uh, we tried to keep that to a minimum of the folks that either were involved in some way or had a role in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I'm just, because this is a native to native conversation and how things are done, those, those fires are not where we collect in one place for a very short number of time, attracting lots of people. They're, they're widespread. So at any one time, we did have lower numbers, but over time, there was a great amount of people that came from very diverse parts of Milwaukee. So with that, in conversations that I had during that vigil, one of the questions came from some of our elders. They're receiving meals from different areas of Milwaukee. Uh, some coming from Ignace, certainly some from Indian Council of the Elderly. 
some coming from other uh, programs that folks are involved with around the city. So essentially what we have is an elder home and if they have the good fortune of, of getting some services and attention, they're getting two, three meals a day, or at least one, but the sources of those meals are coming from very different places with very different hands yep. and with people who have their own exposures to COVID-19 and whether they have it or not, may be asymptomatic carriers, the very people that are delivering food to our homes. And I know we do this all the time, but it is worth it because we always get new viewers. Is that elder happy to be getting that meal and so grateful for it? That meal may be left in on the doorstep or sometimes the elder steps out. And this is what I, when talking with one of the workers late at night, was when I come to the door, they're inviting me in. They, they want me to make me something. They want to talk. They want to visit. And I have other homes to get to, but I also don't want to dishonor that request. And they say sometimes they're in a, a bit of a conundrum. So I'm, I'm hoping you could address that worker's kind of concerns about an elder inviting me into the house, not wanting to be rude, but also that elder's concern stated earlier that same day, because I'm getting meals from four different places. Uh, do I need to be concerned? How, what's my process for bringing that food into the house? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I guess two things. Uh, it would, one would be the, the interaction itself uh, may lend it, knowing that you are healthy or at least don't have, feel good, you, you know, not saying that you have symptoms, but just looking at a prevention standpoint, uh, I think just out of um, uh, prevention, uh, it may not be a bad idea if you were the one that goes in the, into the house um, and to wear some type of covering. So uh, knowing, I know you're not, you wouldn't be the one that's sick, but again, you're looking at minimizing exposure and transmission. That would, that would be the one thing. The second thing, um, and I, I know we've all gotten into some type of new normal um, where we may look at doing quick quick wipe downs of surfaces um, and, and for people who are elders that may not be cooking on a regular basis they may get containers of of, of meals and and you know we all have done this we've all are we've all ordered out and we all get to curbside pick up every once in a while or, or delivery to the house um, and you really don't know um, the contact surfaces, you know, the, uh, the containers that the food comes in and how it's handled or, and such. So um, I usually, if, I, if food comes to the house that I don't prepare myself, I will take the container, remove the food onto a plate and, and discard the container. I don't eat out of the container. I use my own silverware. Um, and so it, it's just a new, I guess, habit, normal habit that I've come accustomed to. But I think it would be, and after handling the container, obviously washing your hands uh, um, would be the most appropriate before you would sit down and, and actually enjoy that meal. So um, that, that would be my only concern. Uh, would be in that regard is transferring food from containers to plates, using your own silverware at home, and washing your hands, um, uh, uh, washing your hands uh, before and after handling the containers. I think that's a great point, and again emphasizes some of the wisdom of the folks that have come before us. And by that I mean, you know, we we've been going into a few years here, uh, in a nod out to the teaching lodge of Milwaukee, uh, other organizations too, by encouraging people to make their own food bundles. Uh, that's something that, that's an ancient and a very old tradition. We don't know how far back it is, but when you're traveling to another place and there's food that's being put out, the utensils, the bowls and things that you're using belong to you. And you're the one who's cleaning them. You're the one who's policing up your area uh, and minimizing those contact surfaces. So. It's pretty neat to be hearing in this native to native conversation a reaffirmation that some of our tribal practices are helping us with today. And we saw a lot of that at the, the vigil 
or people bringing in their own uh, bundles of food, um, their own food bundles of plates and bowls if they were gonna run into everything. And we also saw individually wrapped items. Um, and we saw folks at ceremonies where food would usually be shared amongst many, many people. We saw that a community plate was created and that stood in place of food that would have been shared. And that was a symbolic gesture and people were encouraged to bring uh, four foods that we usually use for our ceremonies. I'm gonna follow up that question with a, a separate elder question that happened on another day. And that was, hey, when I, I get that food delivered to my door, um, I know that I can't eat it. I'm, I'm not eating as much as I used to, but I, I, I appreciate it and I know I have food for tomorrow. I'm going to put that food in the freezer and get it out for breakfast. Uh, is that understanding correct that freezing kills the COVID virus? Um, no, uh, freezing actually may preserve it. Um, so um, you know, chilling it, freezing it, uh, it actually may slow its uh, inactivation or destruction or in uh, freezing it may actually preserve it. Um, um, probably the better way to assure the destruction of any germs um, is microwave. Uh, kind of throw it in the microwave and, and reheat it um, uh, as opposed to uh, yeah, uh, eating food straight out. You know, I know we all like cold pizza uh, the night, the day after, but um, so it's just better to, to kind of throw it in the microwave and reheat heat things. But uh, freezing will not destroy the virus. It may actually preserve and, and make it uh, hang around longer. One of the discussions we were having around the fire, I came in late to this one, so I didn't hear it all. But the concern with the elder folks that were, were talking was their own health conditions. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to them that their health conditions made them more vulnerable to COVID-19. Uh, they were saying if, if we looked at the things that make someone vulnerable to COVID-19, more vulnerable age amongst them, uh, they also saw heart disease, diabetes. Could you address some of those health concerns where boy, somebody is, is being careful, but maybe they should be extra careful, especially in our native community with the number of health disparities we have compared to the United States population in general. Yeah, so I, I, and I think this is uh, in, in communities of color. I think we, 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 we do this um, um, quite often is uh, multi-generational living. Um, the interaction of, of, of youth helping and assisting our elders, uh, whether that be in transportation, whether that be, you know, taking them to the grocery store, or making runs for our family members. Um, those are all good things. And, and certainly in time of need, it is helpful. Uh, but again, we, we know who are at risk. Uh, we know individuals of age and uh, of chronic conditions who are uh, at a higher risk than, than others. There's, as much as they are part of your family, I think you need to still look at, at prevention. And so, um, again, that hand sanitizer keeps coming up, face coverings, uh, masks keep coming up. Um, um, so... You know, I, I have stories of cases, how I suspect cases come about, even though our, our elders may be protecting themselves, staying at home and really limiting contact on the outside. And um, a couple of cases have, have come up. They don't know how they got it, um, but they do know that, you know, there are individuals that may come and go from the house uh, that may make runs for them, that may get food, that may go to the, you know, sp the store or uh, maybe, you know, hardware store or something to bring back to the house. And even though they may not be uh, the people that are helping, they don't mean to, or uh, uh, incidentally, uh, be asymptomatic and have, have it, and that exposure is enough um, uh, for a population that is already at risk, 
um, just a, a, a strong reminder of how protective we need to be. Um, and it's more out of respect for the people we are interacting with, especially our elders, as opposed to ourselves. So it's important to assure that we have those coverings when we're uh, when we have these interactions. One of the pieces that also came up during discussion was some wonderment uh, questions about this. Six weeks ago, a lot of folks didn't know anybody that had COVID-19, mm -hmm. and, and now they do. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they're wanting to visit, they're, they're wanting to, to check up on someone who's living alone and, and does have it. Uh, what suggestions would you give to someone who's concerned about the elder, vulnerable person, or, or just someone who's living alone? They have friends and relatives that want to check in on them. And, and I know just, it, and again, the strength of our community is that we rush to that place. We want to clean it up. We want to wipe the walls down. We want to do dishes for them. We, we want to make sure that they have two, three days of food ready to go. Um, but now we know they have it. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're related to us. Maybe there's there's somebody we love. They're they're only two doors down. H how can they safely interact with that person? How can they they safely check in uh, when they do? And and what kind of questions should they be asking when they're doing the check ins on that person that does have COVID nineteen? So I, I think it's important that um, going into a a household that does have it um, and I know this is going to be hard because this isn't in the general public um, but if you know you're going to be interacting with an individual uh, the face coverings and the face surgical masks actually aren't good enough in prevention you want an N95 mask uh, and these are these uh, these are these medical grade filters masks um, that are used very specifically to minimize people and exposure and, and, and um, uh, transmission when you know someone has COVID. So those are the N95 masks. And so it, it's, you know, if that was to occur, I'd say an N95 mask, um, try to find one. Try to find one if you really want to be in interacting with an individual who who has has the virus uh, a surgical mask can help when you you know just in a general setting when you don't know uh, in terms of a short interaction that can be preventative um, but sometimes people double up on stuff they can wear a surgical mask and a face covering so the interactions may be brief uh, they may be quick um, I'm not saying you have to hold your breath when you go in the house, but um, it, it does need to be deliberate in, in terms of its interactions. And um, um, the interactions may be, here are your items, uh, you know, I could drop them off, call me, I'll be right outside, we can talk and interact with person in the house versus in person, second person being in a car and still have at least the social interaction, even though it may be 20 feet away. So when, when that advocate is, that health advocate, that elder advocate person is, is giving them a call or checking in, are there some questions that, that for you as a doctor, you, you're hoping that that's an extension certainly of healthcare is, is what's exactly is happening with that person what kind of questions would you suggest that that advocate be asking when they're in that presence of that person to person or phone call visit? When they're saying, hey, how are you? The person just says, fine. Uh, what kind of questions would you like to be hearing? Yeah, so kind of the, the biggest things that I wanna know are um, if they feel like they have fevers, if they've been checking uh, their temperatures, uh, a fever, uh, an elevation, anything over 100 certainly may be an, an indication that things are still very active. Um, as And certainly if someone has, let's say their fever is, or their temperature is back to normal, um, it may be a good indication that they are getting better from that perspective. But the, the biggest hallmarks that I wanna know um, is do you have a cough and are you short of breath? 
these are probably the two biggest questions that you can ask. Um, you know, anytime we get a cold or a flu or even bronchitis, um, you know, we get a cough, you know, cough, 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 cough. But this type of cough, it's different. It's a different sense of a cough. Um, it feels like there's a chronic irritation that comes from from that upper chest to, to the throat and cough, 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 but nothing comes out. You know, it's not like having pneumonia. It's not like having bronchitis when you cough and stuff comes up. This is a different, it is a dry, minor mucus generating cough. Nothing comes out. On top of that, I wanna know if someone's short of breath. To be short of breath with coronavirus, is a pretty good indication that this virus is directly involving the lung tissue itself and the and the smaller air cells that exchange um, um, may be um, highly inflamed and involved so people can be short of breath i mean with this virus that would be a really good indication that this is more serious than just a, a normal cold. <clears throat> so to be a bad cough, not that's not productive, and being short of breath, um, these are pretty significant signs that something more than just having a moderate, this is more severe. And it may mean, it may mean an indication and a, and a visit to the emergency room. Um, certainly if these cough and the shortness of breath progress and get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, that would be an indication that this is getting um, um, kind of a critical point of, of being evaluated. Now, of course, can, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so people can have headaches. They can have a sore throat. It comes and goes. Sore throats are okay. Headaches, as long as they're not debilitating to the point of, 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 you know, I can't move my arm or leg, you know, you're going to be tired, you're going to be fatigued, you're going to take a lot of naps, you're, you're going to have muscle aches, joint aches, you're not going to have an appetite, you may have loose stools, and you're not going to have a taste or smell. These are all kind of go with it, but those aren't as bad or severe as if I wanted to know about your cough and you're being short of breath. Those are the things I really want to know uh, that will help gauge whether or not you're getting worse or you're getting better. Uh, let's say they get that information and it's concerning to them. They, they have one or two of the things you're talking about. And this is a person who says, um, as a lot of our elders are, well, I don't want to be a bother to anybody. You know, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be fine. I'm watching. Once that person gets that information, what do you, what do you want them to do? if those flags are coming up in that conversation, they've asked those questions you've suggested and that other person, don't worry about me, I'll be fine. You know, I, I think we've all had that conversation with grandma or grandpa, or mom or dad. Uh, what do you want them to do? I, I think it's important to lay out some phone numbers uh, where they can get to them, um, whether list them out, put them in their phone, their cell phones, uh, even emergency contact, uh, uh, basically emergency contact list. Uh, that way it's easily available. It's right there if things do go sideways uh, or get worse to the point where, you know, they don't have to fumble around the house to try to find it or remember. 911 would be an option as a, as, as a kind of a last resort. Um, but again, uh, I think that emergency contact is going to be important. If it's during normal hours, I guess, you know, not at two o'clock in the morning, but let's say, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning. Don't hesitate to call your primary care doctor. Um, call the clinic that you go to and, and say, hey, I got X, Y, and Z going on. They're getting worse. They should, at that point, be able to assist and help and direct you on what you should be doing. As, as people are kind of watching me on the screen, as, as, you're, as you're talking, uh, I'm trying to pay attention to the chat window uh, located on the bottom of everybody's screen, there's this bubble there that says chat. If you press that, you can ask a written question. Why my head's bouncing to the left and right, 
I got two phones, uh, one with one phone number and another phone that, that folks know. <laughs> They're asking me questions on the phone. I've run into this on a few programs now. If you ask the question in the chat window, we will get to it. If we don't get to it right now, we'll get to it next week. You don't have to be calling me on the phones, but I know it's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, so this one comes from a couple guys sitting out there watching together. Uh, one is singer, one a dancer. Mm -hmm. uh, so native native conversation is if you have any f information uh, both of those vocations uh, you know these are a couple guys that makes you know some uh, money for their family doing this mm -hmm. singing and dancing uh, are there any long-term implications or damage being done to people's lungs mm -hmm. after recovery from COVID-19 uh, if issues come up, what is somebody looking at um, just physically? Uh, and these guys are, I'd say, between that 20 to 35-year-old age range. Yeah. So what we're learning about the, the effects um, of, of coronavirus. So we know, um, let's say you are a healthy individual. Uh, you're active, whether it be singing, dancing, or any other physical uh, sport or activity. Um, more than likely, if you get the virus, you will return. You will recover and return back to your your normal your normal state of health uh, even before that. However, there's a subsegment of individuals, and and we're finding out it it almost it doesn't matter if you're extremely healthy, super. Um, world-class athlete to even underlying chronic conditions. People may recover, and if they end up going to the hospital, and even let's go into ICU or get intubated uh, on a machine, um, you, the chances you will recover, yes, but there will be long-lasting effects of the virus. How significant, we don't know yet, we're still kind of figuring out as we go, but there is definitely lung damage that does occur. Um, you know, there are people who have actually received lung transplants, um, young people in their, one young person that I read about in their 20s got a lung, double lung transplant because coronavirus destroyed their lungs so bad. This is a 20 year old that was absolutely healthy going in uh, before this. The bottom line is if, if there is a hospitalization or intubation, the likelihood that you will have lung injury and damage is very high. How significant that will be, that we're still finding out. We don't know what the recovery part is. The recovery may take months, may take six months, it may take a year before. Um, you may never get back to 100% of your lung function that you were at but maybe you get back 80%. And what does that 80% mean in terms of what you do either as a profession uh, or a, an activity? So, um, you know, runners, uh, I've heard runners have gotten infections and, and even though they didn't end up being in the hospital or, or intubated, they still can't get back to the level of physical activity um, um, before. Um, after, after having the virus, they can't get back to that same level. They can get to some of that level, but not the full. So there are side effects and there can be short term, uh, which the majority of us uh, who, who do get it will recover and do just fine. There is sub segments and sub segments of people that are gonna have lung problems, um, either short term and maybe permanent. Uh, Dr. Ignace, we're, we're coming close to the, uh, the time mm -hmm. where we're going to close out. We, we try to end at 4.30, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I do want to let everybody know in your humility and, and certainly the organization that it was the Gerald L. Ignace Health Center that gave us the childhood uh, masks to fit children so they would do mm -hmm. well, and adults as well, and, and we do appreciate it. And by we, I mean there is a host of people besides me just talking right now to, to put that together in organizations. And uh, in exchange for that, you know, certainly we don't exchange money on that kind of thing, but, but we'd like to work with your staff 
uh, in putting together feast bundles, uh, mm -hmm. COVID-19 awareness kind of thing. And maybe that can be worked into a summer program, elder program, part of the delivery yeah. uh, that gets to the home. So, so that's just mm -hmm. our way of thanking you for making sure that our community is healthy and that people could be present during a, a very ancient tradition and, and a, a way of showing resilience for our community. With that, uh, Jeremiah, I'm, I'm going to see if there's anything that you'd like to follow up on or, or, or announcements of awareness. In the very last voice, everyone out there, you're going to be hearing from Dr. Ignace. So I am out for my segment. Thank you for your time and patience. Uh, Jeremiah, I'm, I'm turning this over to you and Dr. Ignace for the last word. So thank you, everyone. Be healthy. And uh, I'm going to just going to be paying attention to our last few moments. Thank you. Thank you again, Mark. And um, <laughs> great. <laughs> That's all interruption there. Um, and um, I'd just like to remind everyone, please, between now and our next week's session, uh, pay attention to our Facebook page, uh, www.facebook.com slash Glick. Um, also, if you would like to be on the Zoom account or on the Zoom presentation um, with us, we are sending that out via email, um, via our newsletter. So if you'd like to join in and be part of our newsletter, please go to our website. You can uh, subscribe to the newsletter there. Um, just a little different, you know, interaction there. Uh, we do also, we'll also be pulling, posting the full recording of the, our session here on our YouTube channel. And again, it is always uh, available um, pretty much uh, for as long as we can keep it up there on Facebook uh, for the time being. So uh, with that, I will uh, pass you on to Dr. Ignace. And once again, thank you all for coming and joining us today. Thank you. Uh, Jeremiah and, and and thank you Mark for your your moderation and, and your your um, certainly being your humility and, and being able to provide and, and shape these questions in a way that I think I'm able to answer them to to everyone in, in, in a way that I think everyone can understand um, I think in, in this in this pandemic we're we're always faced with a lot of challenges um, we're faced with even the daily questions of, of what we what do we do today? What do we do tomorrow? Uh, what are we going to do next week? Um, and not just from a family perspective, I think from 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 just a community activity, uh, from an, a community as a whole. How do we how do we move forward? How do we get through all this? And and I, I think I had mentioned the the number for the state of Wisconsin uh, spiked. <clears throat> Um, into the 400s uh, in the last 24 hours. And it's just a, a very, uh, you know, strong reminder that this, this isn't going away. And, and so um, what I think in, everyone has probably heard this adage of you don't have to work harder, you have to work smarter. And so how do we work through this? And I think interactions and, and discussions like what Mark and I have had in, in helping um, helping one another in, in support of what we feel is important, not just as individuals and families, but from a community standpoint and tradition and, 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 and maintaining that cultural activity. You know, I think I had mentioned this once where this may be one of those times where the interface of, of traditional and cultural uh, approaches to Western medicine, it, this may be th that time um, where there has to be this interaction, this integration of, of, uh, of prevention and mitigation needs to occur. And I think, um, you know, if it's, uh, if it's, if this is something that Mark and I can help create i'm all for that because i think at the end of the day um we as native people need to continue and maintain those traditions in those cultural ways and i'm all for that and i know mark is all for that and i know our community wants that and so uh, whatever putting our brains together to try to figure out how this works uh is makes it ever even more important now 
um, and, and how we maintain those, how do we maintain those, uh, those, those traditions of, of, uh, of culture that we can pass on. So always look at prevention, always look at um, how we can open those lines of communication uh, um, because I want uh, our, our communities to be not only active, um, but maintain a level of, of activity even before this, but do it in a smart and effective way that keeps us all uh, strong. So um, I appreciate uh, everyone listening and um, please uh, pass on to, to your friends, families, or anybody who wants to know more about uh, natives talking about uh, the um, the coronavirus that's going on, please feel free to pass this on. And we would be more than welcome, uh, welcoming to have uh, anybody come on and listen and, and ask questions. So thank you. And, and until next week, um, stay strong.